Today we're going to get back in the groove of talking about this thought of overcoming strongholds in our life. The idea of a stronghold is a, an ingrained way of thinking in our application when it's wrong thinking that's often resistant to change. And both this morning and tonight, we're going to kind of think about that thought. And the title this morning is simply this, Trusting God in Troubled Times, and with special emphasis on overcoming the stronghold of perplexity. Overcoming the stronghold of perplexity. I could use other words there. Anxiety, worry, confusion. Those things can be strongholds in our life that diminish our quality of life, and that's not where the Lord wants us to live. You know, one of the unfortunate realities of living in a sinful world, which we do, is that sometimes life can be hard. I think the reason that Christie's song touches us so much is in part is we know we need to run to Jesus. Sometimes there's, there's nothing else we can do, um, and we have to run to him. You know, people... Boy, you can love them, but boy, they, they sure can hurt. Circumstances, they happen. Uh, reigns of the just and the unjust. Uh, life, difficulties, they just seem to come. Life can be hard, it can be unfair, it can be damaging, disappointing, and sometimes hurtful. People can hurt us, circumstances can, just life. You know what, not all of life is like that. The song mentioned that too. There's times to dance, there's times to sing, there's times to applause, there's times the you know, life is wonderful and great and good. There's a truth to be contemplated is that life brings with it in its long journey seasons, different times, good and bad. In Genesis chapter 8, God said, While the earth remaineth, sea time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night, shall not cease. God says that life has a rhythm to it. And there'll be dark times and light times, good times and bad times. It's just part of living in this world. It's the way he made life under the sun. We know this same truth in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. It says, And to everything, life and heart, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And verse 4 says this, A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. And that's important for us to understand is that life has these rhythms, that life has these seasons, because otherwise we might be blindsided. You might just be merely going your way, and all of a sudden, boom, a freight train hits. You're going, what's that about? A failure to understand can leave us unprepared mentally, emotionally, and spiritually for times when challenges come. We need to be ready to combat the battle of the mind and the heart when difficulty comes. We need to be able to guard our hearts in difficult circumstances so we don't quit, get angry, walk away, and give in to things that can damage both body and mind and heart. <clears throat> I want to ask you if you would, go ahead and stand with me. We'll look at the text. And <clears throat> I want us to really contemplate today the stronghold of anxiety, perplexity, and maybe this morning, just in a little way, overcome it if we can. In Philippians chapter 4, a very familiar text, we'll begin our reading of verse number 6 of chapter 4, where the Bible says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And look here. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, and whatsoever things are just, and whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, and whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on those things. Our Heavenly Father, we ask your help for these next few moments to overcome the stronghold of anxiety, of perplexity, Lord, confusion, bewilderment that sometimes can reside in our hearts in difficult times. Lord, I pray that we would run to you, that, Lord, we would learn to go to you in these seasons that we might be helped. We'll ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you for standing. Thank you so very much for that. You can be seated. In 18... 95, Rudyard Kipling wrote a poem 
It was inspired by a battle of that day that went very poorly. Um, it was a hurtful time, a damaging time. It was a difficult time. If you don't know who Mr. Kipling was, he was a great author, a great writer, an inspiring man. And uh, he often wrote to inspire people to love God, country, and others. And so he wrote a note in the form of a poem to his son. Now, this is written in some of an older style, so I'd ask you to listen carefully to what this man is saying in the poem. It's titled simply, If. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowances for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired of waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make your dreams your master, if you can think and not make your thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you've given life to broken and then stoop and build them with worn-out tools, if you can make one heap of all life's winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve you long after they've been gone, and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will which says, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch, if neither foe nor loving friend can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much. If you can feel the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Man, that's a powerful thought, isn't it? If. The poem clearly expresses a great truth that we need to fight sometimes with all of mind, spirit, and soul the circumstances around us so they do not control us. Man, isn't it easy for life to overwhelm, to bewilder, to confuse, for things not to go the way you planned for them to go. And then for those things to dominate heart and mind, to linger, live on, well past the event, to develop a life of their own, and then in time control you. I have a simple question for you this morning. What's controlling your mind? What dominates heart and thought today? Rudolf Kipling says uh, you need to be careful For if you don't battle these things, you're going to lose in a way that will diminish life. You and I will be better off by not allowing our attitudes and actions to be dictated by the circumstances and negativity of life. Instead, the Word of God teaches temperance of mind, self-control, the guarding of the heart, being responsible to respond properly to the events and people in life, even when it's not good, And sometimes when it is, I have just a few thoughts this morning that I think can help us overcome the stronghold of anxiety, allowing these negative things to influence us in bad ways. And the first one, you'll find in the very first words of our text in chapter, verse 6, I want you to ask, I want to ask you this morning, I want you to consider a prohibition that the Word of God gives us, a prohibition. Verse number 6 says, be careful for nothing. It's a prohibition. Be careful for nothing. The word careful can be used in our vernacular in a variety of ways. 
one, one of those ways is as in being cautious. If we were to ever have snow here and winter roads with snow on them, we might say, hey, when you're driving, be careful. The thought there be, be cautious so damage or harm is not done to you. But in the text, the word means something much different than that. It means uh, don't have anxiety. Don't be worried. Don't be perplexed in mind and spirit. It says, be careful. Don't be anxious. Don't be, uh, have anxiety, perplexity in anything in life. When life gets really hard, out of control, and perplexing, God gives you and God gives me a prohibition of what not to think and do. He says, don't let your mind and don't let your heart and, and don't let the state of your soul fret and worry and be anxious and be perplexed about the things that are going on around you. That's not a, a, a good place to go. It's not a healthy place to go. It's not a spiritual place to go. He says, be careful, anxious, uh, perplexed about nothing. Don't let your mind be controlled by these things. Don't let your heart be dominated by those thoughts that create anxiety. I think, as people, every one of us has traveled that road before, haven't we? If we have any commonality at all as people, it's that we've probably worried about things far too long. I've had first hand experience, as I'm sure you've had, about the damaging, absorbing thoughts of negativity, worry, and perplexity. You know, in my world as a pastor in ministry, I, I hope you know this, I want so badly to do right and would admit eagerly, <laughs> I'm a person, I, you know, I'm, I do the best I can. I so badly want to help sometimes don't have a clue how to even offer it. I want to meet the needs. I want to be here. I want to do that. I want to say the right things. I want to lead properly. And yet as a person, a sinner myself, I fill that role often inadequately. I know I disappoint. I know I don't measure up. I know sometimes I'm rejected and even misunderstood. And you know, <clears throat> knowing that can, can ruin you. It can, I'm telling you, it can ruin you. It can linger in here far too long when sometimes people you've tried to help don't respond the way you want them to when you're misunderstood and then it just all comes back at you. In my world and in yours, in yours as well, in, in ways that, in stories you could tell, man, that's rough. That's rough. And that can linger. You know, I, I've let things linger months maybe years sometimes, and it is not what God wants for any of us. Parents can find themselves totally perplexed by their children. As employees, we do our best not to be rewarded, maybe to be fired, and we stand there perplexed, and now anxiety reigns in our heart. I disappoint. I'm disappointed. I don't measure up. And others don't. <clears throat> I mess up. Uh, there's things said about me, things said about you, and uh, it, it just doesn't really work in our hearts very well. An author, speaking of this prohibition, said this. He said, this prohibition is extensive. The Greek word translated nothing means not even once. No, not at all. It is emphatic. It includes all things we might possibly worry about. There aren't any exemptions or exceptions in this text. The command is simple. Don't worry. That's not an easy thing to do, but since it is commanded by God, we know it must be possible, and we know that it is. I, I love his illustration here, and I won't retell really it. I'm just going to read it instead. He said, when I was taking driver's education back in high school, they taught about steering. I'll never forget what the teacher said, aim high. He pointed out that most new drivers look too close to the hood of the car. He said, if your attention is focused on what's right in front of you, you will miss things that are coming at you. Then he said, you tend to drive where you look. If you look out the window at something, you will tend to start drifting in that direction. Well, that happened to this week in 
Colorado. I was looking at a herd of deer. There's a big buck there, and I was admiring him as my car was moving oh so closely to the car right next to me, who happened to be Dwight Sines, who was trying to pass me on a very windy road. <laughs> and he says this, life is that same way. When we are focused on our worries, they grow and take control of our minds. Why did Peter sink when he was walking on the water toward Jesus? Because he focused on the winds and the waves instead of the Lord. Don't allow yourself to be driven and dominated by worry. Let them be dominated by thoughts of the Lord. You know, God says to you and God says to me in troubling times, don't let the stronghold of worry take control of us. And maybe today that you're there. I'd ask the question again, what's dominating controlling your thoughts and mind today. Okay, well, if that's the prohibition, what's the solution? Well, God gives that in the next few verses here. Look here with me in Philippians chapter 6. It says, be careful for nothing, but, he says this instead, in everything, in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. See, we have not just a prohibition, but direction here also now to pray instead. But in everything by prayer, he says, whatever comes your way, I want you to learn to pray. You see, the only way to worry about nothing is to learn to pray about everything. The only way not to worry about things is to pray about them. As Christians, we need to meet every trial, every tribulation, every test, good or bad in life, with prayer. As elementary as that is, we often don't do it. We have a tendency, rather, to find our own solutions. But I want to say to you, sometimes you can't find the answer for life's perplexities. You can't change someone else's heart. You can't make someone do right. You, you can't make life the way you want it sometimes. You can't. And so to beat your head against the wall for a solution that does not exist is silly. Silly. So what do I do? Well, I'll worry. But what good comes of that? Instead, why don't you do what the Bible says? Pray. There's power in a prayer. You know, if we don't pray, we're going to find our own solutions that won't work. We might run away. We might quit. We might freeze up. We might grow despondent and dark. We might become bitter. That's why the Bible, I think, says in part in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. In other words, pray about everything. See, when we pray about everything, when we pray without ceasing, it does two things. Number one, it's productive. It's productive. You're talking to the Creator. You're speaking at the throne of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Master of everything, Almighty God. And my friend, if he chooses not to change it, it's not going to be changed. But why would we not go to him first? And often, for the things that concern our hearts. It's productive, and secondly, it's protective. See, when we don't go to God, then we stew on our worries. We worry of our worries. We, we, we fret. We're anxiety. We have anxiety. We're perplexed. And those things become strongholds in our life, and we, we live there. And sometimes we die there. And, and, and life becomes to be controlled by those things. And our disposition, our demeanor, our attitude, our outlook of life is now dominated by the stronghold of worry. It's a terrible, terrible place to be. We will be better off in every way if we would learn to pour out our hearts before God in all the issues of life. Please listen. Griping, complaining, Venting and getting things off our chest never makes things better. Being frustrated, and perplexed, bitter, mad, and angry do not usually make a bad situation any better. When we entertain these thoughts, they become strongholds. They dominate. They control. They become prisons for our thinking and lives. They diminish our quality of life. And look here. Those thoughts that reside there now diminish our life in a far greater way than the action or activity outside of us ever could. 
Does that make sense? So if someone says something bad about you, is that bad? It's bad. But now what happens in our heart can become far worse if we let it. So, so you, you lose your job. A relationship is broken. Uh, you're, you're spoken evil of. Are those bad? Sure, they're bad, but not near as bad as what could happen in here if you let it. Those things may restrain somewhat, but they'll never be the prison that your mind can be. They'll never diminish you and hurt you and, and shortchange you and limit you the way your mind will if it stays dominated on those things. Those things can't take away your smile the way the heart and mind can if it meditates on these things. When we go to those places, we become dark inside. When we entertain these thoughts, they become strongholds that steal from us. But when we talk to God, but when we talk to God, and when you and I learn to pour our hearts to Him, then things have the possibility and potential to change. Anybody here want anything in your life to change? I mean, just think about it. Anybody here, anybody in this room, is there anything in your life that you want to see changed? I want to ask you something. For all the griping, complaining, worrying, nagging, perplexity, confusion, discouragement you feel, how much has it changed? So why in the world would people who have access to an almighty God not go to him? What is it about us that is so prone and bent to discovering solutions that do not exist outside of God? If you want things to change, have the hope of change on the authority of the Word of God, then you need to go to Him. We see this principle lived out in the life of David. Boy, you read the Psalms and David poured out his life to God. But I think I especially like the example of Daniel. He was a man who was able to peacefully sleep through a night in the lion's den. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 to 11, here's what it said. Now Daniel knew that the writing was signed. In other words, he knew, in a way, death could be imminent. So he went to his house. And his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and he prayed. I don't have the power to fight lions. I think I'll pray instead. I can't change the king's mind, so I just think I'll pray about it. I can't help it that I live in this country, overtaken. I think I'll just pray. And so he did. And he didn't just survive, the man thrived. And I might just add a word about the text here. It says, let your... It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer, supplication. Now, let's these next two words, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. Just a side note here. As hard as it might be to do this, thank the Lord for what he's doing and allowing in your life. You know, it could be that the difficulty you're going through has a bigger picture attached to it. Someone else is being helped that you don't know about. Or maybe some lesson in life that God wants you to learn. He might even be providing for you in a way you can't understand. Or understand. There's a, another story here I really liked on the same chapter. It said this In the hiding place, Corrie Ten Boom told the story of her time with her sister Betsy at the dreaded Ravensbrück death camp during the Holocaust. They were arrested for hiding Jews from the Gestapo and placed in the women's dorm at the prison. It says, When they arrived, they found it was infested with fleas. Corey was horrified, but her sister said they were to follow the scripture and in everything give thanks. Later they found out that because the fleas were so bad that the guards would not enter the room. Therefore they were able to conduct Bible studies and led many women to the Lord because of what seemed like a burden at the time that was too hard to bear. I'm telling you, um, if we could learn to be thankful for what God is teaching us in hard times and be thankful and then pray to him about it, we'd always be better off. We'd be richer and not poorer. 
So we have a prohibition. We're supposed to pray. And then the Lord gives us a really neat promise here. He says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made unto God, and add the promise, verse 7, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds from strongholds through Christ Jesus. The idea of peace, look here at me just for a second. The idea of peace, boy, it's a really powerful one in the Bible. In the mind of Jewish people, Jewish thinking, Bible thinking, peace is paramount. Peace is, is at the top of, of virtues, of things desired. The Jews desired peace more than they desired things. They hoped and prayed and desired peace. Shalom is the hope of the Jewish world. Shalom, Alakim. In return, Alakim, Shalom is the standard greeting. Peace be unto you, and unto you, my friend, peace. In the Bible, peace has three distinct meanings. Number one, it means to be safe. No harm, no injury, no threat. Nothing dire can come my way. It means to be happy. My life is filled with joy. Song, dance, it's, it's, it's uh, filled with wonderful things. And then to be well in soul and spirit and mind, solid and sound, without compromise, peace. The Hebrews and early Christians lived in nearly constant struggle. The threat of war, persecution were present and real. Their minds and hearts would have been destroyed if not for asking God in the midst of all that, for peace. That's what Isaiah said, that will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. You see, the opposite of peace is worry. Worry takes us from God, but peace takes us to him. It's a gift from God. Anxiety, worry, is a tool of the devil to diminish our life and to distance us from God. That's why God says, be careful for nothing. It's not productive. It, it, it won't help you, but coming to me will. Jesus said in John chapter 14, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, and not as the world giveth, give I unto you. He said, Let not your heart be troubled. He says, Neither let it be afraid. When Paul said our text, the Philippians, Peace will keep your hearts and minds. The word Keep there meant the idea of garrison, fortress, fortitude, a wall that could not be penetrated by any of the events of life. Worry, if it gets into our hearts, can grow, control, dominate, diminish, and in time destroy heart and spirit. So as Christians, we're prohibited from even allowing it to enter into our minds and hearts. Don't give place to the devil through worry, anxiety, and perplexity. It accomplishes nothing but harm. And then finally, there's a purpose for all this because God wants to guard our mind and thinking. Look with me here in verse number 8. He says, Then finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. And he goes to this great list. At the end, he says, Now think. Remember, this is the battle for the mind, strongholds. Think on these things. You and I to protect our hearts and minds from bad thoughts, imprisoning strongholds, and diminish life by allowing our thoughts to dwell on worry, bad things, anxiety, past experiences, negativity, the hurts and issues of life. By praying and pouring our hearts out to God, listen, things can change in your life. Things can improve. And instead of fears and concerns, is what God says. You pray and then you learn to look for the good things in life. Because I want to tell you, for all of us, there are some. You're looking at me, aren't, today, aren't you, today? Most of you are looking at me. And thank God for sight. Because what would life be without it? Most of you have clothes to put on today. You have a home to go home to. You have food to eat when you get there. There's a big part of the world that doesn't have any of that. You've got a car to get into. Instead of fears and concerns, think of the good in your life, what the Lord has done for you. 
the blessings that no doubt abound if you'll discover them. Look at the potential for the future. Stop looking in the past. Ask God for lessons about the present. Learn to replace evil thoughts with good thoughts. Control the mind. Cast down fears. Cast down worry. Cast down imaginations. Bring all these things into captivity. 2 Corinthians 10. Jesus taught this principle so clearly in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. He talks about a house. It had devils in it. He said, now you sweep it clean, but don't leave it that way. Can I tell you this? A great principle. You and I are not just to avoid evil in life. And not just avoid evil thoughts. Because it says if you just avoid evil, he said in time it will come back sevenfold. So what's our strategy? Replace it with good. Fill the house and fill the chamber, fill the mind, and fill the heart with good thoughts, Jesus is saying to the Apostle Paul. Whatever's good, would you please get your mind on that? Whatever's thankworthy, praiseworthy, good, happy, wholesome, pure, then you start putting your mind on those things. Don't let a stronghold of bitterness, anxiety, worry, confusion, perplexity get in there and grow. It's not what I want for you as a child of God. You guide your thoughts. You guide your heart. You direct your emotions. And these things will change your perspective and allow God's blessings and peace to come. So I'm going to ask you the question again, and for the last time today. What's in your heart and mind today? What are you worried about? What are you concerned about today? I'm not saying you shouldn't be concerned. I'm just saying, what are you doing with the thoughts? You worry about your job? Okay. So you're worried about it. Let's pray about it today. Pray about it. And then thank God for what you have had and what you might have. You got a relationship problem? Okay. You're probably worried about it long enough. Let's pray about it. You got a parent problem, you got a child problem. You can worry if you want to. Not very productive. Not very protective. So why wouldn't you talk to God about it? Why wouldn't you ask him for his help? And then I imagine you could find something to thank him for. I'm just telling you, it's easy to allow the stronghold of perplexity to get a foothold in here. It's just gonna hurt you. I want to do this Sunday morning, whatever. It's formal. People don't move. You don't have to if you don't want to. But I'm going to tell you, um, it's a great time, as Christy said, to come to Jesus. If there is something, anything of heart that you haven't committed to him that's perplexing you, that's, that you're worrying about today, why wouldn't you simply obey the scripture and pray? I can I ask you to stand with me this morning? Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your guidance here. Lord, it's very simple but quite profound. And Lord, I pray that today, that Lord, as the saints here have gathered, Lord, we would understand there's seasons of life and sometimes hard and bad. And Lord, we're negligent to pray as we should. And so Lord, today, teach us to pray. Lord, I pray today people would pour out their hearts to you. And Lord, they'd, they'd find uh, something to praise you for. And that, Lord, we would not allow the stronghold of perplexity, confusion, discouragement, anxiety, and worry to reign in our hearts. Lord, we'd be much better off to be controlled by the Spirit of God. And so, Lord, if you'd speak to us, I pray people would come and deal with you. I want to ask your heads to remain bowed just for a moment. We've had many people come. If you need to come, I'm going to invite you to come right now as well. Would you come? Would you commit the things you're thinking about to the Lord? Don't allow them to linger there in a negative way, in a bad way, in a fruitless way. But bring them to Jesus today. Invite the peace of God into your heart. Allow for the provision of God in your life. Just
you need to, I'd invite you to come pray. Jesse, what you lose in a verse or two of trusting Jesus? If you're praying this morning, I invite you to continue to do that. But you've done this with the Lord, and if you've got ever sing, let's just sing us a prayer today. Trusting Jesus. Trusting every day. If you need to come, we still have time to come this morning. We still have time for you to come. Trust morning, as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting in whatever before, trusting Jesus. That well, just to sing another verse, if you will. We still have people coming. If you need to come, we still have time to do that today. You're sure welcome to pray where you're at. Let's uh, says he will keep your heart in perfect peace if you'll just trust in him. See, that's what prayer is. It's trust. It's a cry for help. God, I can't fix it. Don't know what to do with it, but I know you can. It's a whole lot more helpful than worry. It's a whole lot more helpful. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you one last time together as a church family for your instruction today. And Lord, I pray we'd be more than hearers only today, but doers of your word. And that, Lord, when we're tempted to worry, we consider the prohibition, be careful for nothing. And then, Lord, consider the alternative. But in prayer, Lord, through prayer, Lord, we present everything to you. All our requests will go to you in thanksgiving. And then, Lord, we know the promise that you'll protect and guard our hearts. You'll intervene in life and give us a peace that passes all understanding. God, thank you for these truths today. I pray you'll help us to meditate on them and think about them. And, Lord, Apply them for our own. We ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen.